Okay, chapter 24. Chapter 24 covers um, a very diffuse and confusing world of the gastrointestinal disorders, so abdominal pains, acute abdomens, and whatnot. The biggest problem with uh, most of these emergencies is the fact that we don't often have much to go on. So it's very, very vague symptoms in many cases, and so it makes it very difficult for us to uh, pin down a working diagnoses or uh, an impression on these. So uh, as with all of our chapters uh, and all of our reading, uh, if you have not studied uh, and read the chapter, uh, please do not use this in, in place of it. Uh, this is intended to be supplementary to your own reading and studying of the text. The AEMT will be able to apply fundamental knowledge to provide basic and selected advanced emergency care and transportation based on the assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. In this case, we have in the non-narrated PowerPoint, you have a uh, AAA video that you can watch. We have uh, just a couple of objectives in this chapter on uh, 608 and 609. All right, <clears throat> so the GI system, gastrointestinal system, uh, and those disorders are often uh, present us with a vague complaint of abdominal pain. However, we also need to understand that not all abdominal pain is of a gastrointestinal nature. Sometimes we have things that are mimicking uh, so we could have, say, a uh, cardiac issue that makes the patient present with an abdominal pain. could actually be a um, urinary issue, could potentially be a uh, genital issue. So there's a variety of things that kind of come into play, not to mention could be a musculoskeletal issue. All right, that goes with your case study. All right, so a, a little brief uh, review of anatomy here. Uh, if we look at the cross section, uh, so a mid-sagittal section uh, of a patient, this is pretty representative of what we would, would see. We have a, a few things um, uh, that we can note right off the bat here is everything's kind of interconnected. Uh, there's a lot of of that uh, of the what we refer to as as either the omentum or or the uh, uh, mesentery that kind of hooks everything together. So it kind of all dangles in place. So as we look at this kind of cross section here, we can look at things such as uh, the mesentery, which is kind of the webbing more or less between all of the uh, small intestines kind of keeps them in their various places. We have the large intestine, which is com somewhat suspended between um, mesentery and then the greater omentum. Uh, we have the lesser omentum that's in there as well. Those kind of work as, as uh, protective uh, layers and uh, suspensory ligaments. The liver up there, the liver is part of the, of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, it's not necessarily directly hooked to uh, the, uh, the the grand tube that we talked about as it uh, goes on down through the system. And uh, the uh, omentum, uh, I'm sorry, the liver is uh, kind of a, a supplementary organ, although that's where most of the processing of our nutrients actually occurs. Um, You've got the stomach that's in there. Not, the pancreas is kind of tucked back behind in the uh, retroperitoneal space, kind of sits behind and usually actually a little below the stomach. Um, we also have, uh, they, they show the, the duodenum as being back there, uh, kind of behind everything there. The, uh, in the retroperitoneal space, don't forget, we also have the kidneys tucked in there, which aren't part of the GI system, they're part of the GU system. Um, and then it all kind of comes together and exits through the rectum. So to look on it from uh, straight on, uh, remember we tend to divide the abdominal uh, cavity into four quadrants, uh, and we uh, can kind of base some of our um, assessment and our 
impression off of some of the information we get based off of the quadrant of the complaint. So in the right upper quadrant, it's almost it's mostly liver. Uh, the, the big majority of the liver is there. The gallbladder, which sits up inside and kind of tucked in the liver, is there. A large amount of the large uh, intestine the, or the colon. A little bit of the small intestine is found up in there. Um, and uh, the tail of the pancreas, actually it's the, technically the head of the pancreas, um, is, uh, is tucked over on that side as well. If we cross over to the left upper, uh, we have a little bit of the liver over there. We have a lot of stomach. The spleen is tucked up in there as well, behind the stomach. Um, we have the large intestine or the colon, a large amount of the pancreas, and some of the small intestine um, that are uh, in uh, that quadrant. The lower quadrants are almost identical. Uh, there's one exception to this. We have in the both lower quadrants, we have large intestine or colon, we have small intestine, and the majority of the small intestine uh, is what takes up both of those quadrants. Um, we have some significant arteries and veins. We have the uh, ureters that come off of the kidneys, which are tucked retroperitoneally. We also have the um, vermiform appendix on the right side. So the appendix is right at the connection between the small intestine and the large intestine, just south of the ileocecal valve. Um, remember, the appendix really doesn't have, per se, a true job in humans these days. It's uh, theorized that at one point uh, it may have acted as a second stomach uh, when uh, our ancestors maybe were more of a, a plant-based ruminant diet. Uh, as opposed to uh, how we've evolved to to kind of be an omnivore, but um, you know, again, that's a lot of a lot of uh, speculation there. And uh, uh, really, all we find in it is number one, there's some lymphatic tissue there, and secondly, it's a good place for something to get lodged and cause some inflammation, cause it to burst, and people get really sick. But, and then down in the pelvic bowl, of course, you have the female reproductive anatomy, a little bit of the, the male internal stuff, as well as the urinary bladder, urethra, um, and then uh, the rectum, of course. So along the midline, you have both your uh, both of your greater vessels. You have the, uh, the aorta and uh, the inferior vena cava, uh, the spine. All right, so when we're doing a physical examination, uh, we divide that uh, abdomen into four quadrants, two uppers, two lowers. Uh, we divide right through the umbilicus, straight up and down, straight left to right. Um, those abdominal organs get classified as either solid or hollow, uh, and based off of what their real process is, is, the hollow organs typically are tubular. They move the stuff along, so things like both uh, large and small intestine, the stomach, the gallbladder, uh, the urinary bladder, those are all hollow organs, whereas things like the pancreas and the liver um, are a, uh, uh, the spleen are a solid organ, so there's a lot more tissue base there. Um, characteristic of solid organ issues is they bleed and bleed and bleed. Characteristic of hollow organ issues is if they burst open, they spill their content, they spill their acids in their juices into the abdominal cavity and cause a, a lot of uh, uh, issues. So um, so the, the full alimentary tract uh, going from mouth to the anus, um, remember we've got a lot of accessory things that will come into play. Um, we've got uh, different salivary glands. The teeth play a part in it. The epiglottis, of course, plays a part in it um, because the uh, the epiglottis is intended to keep food and water out of our uh, respiratory tract. The esophagus, leading from the mouth down to uh, the stomach, while it's not in the abdominal cavity, um, sometimes it does kind of play a little bit of a part because we'll get a little acid erosion in our esophagus or something called a hiatal hernia where part of the stomach actually pulls up through the diaphragm um, and causes a, a few issues there. 
and then uh, and we can go on and on. There's a, a variety of other parts and pieces here that are probably not uh, ridiculously uh, important for us to know. We've got things like the bile duct. We've got the common bile duct, which actually uh, lies in the um, the pancreas. Um, we've got uh, the pyloric sphincter, which is on the south side of the stomach, the cardiac sphincter on the north side of the stomach, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, the rectum, the anus. So ultimately not um, not uh, real, real important that we commit all these little little uh, novelty things to, uh, to memory. We have large blood vessels in the abdominal cavity in the retroperitoneal space, and we know this. We know that, that our greater vessels, um, our uh, uh, aorta and uh, the, uh, the inferior vena cava, um, tuck back there around the spine. You also have the kidneys back there retroperitoneally. Uh, the, D, the GI system is a very long tube from the mouth to the anus, and it includes lots of accessory organs, whether it be salivary glands, the pancreas, the liver, the gallbladder, um, that all kind of kick in their own uh, parts and pieces. Um, you know, the, the stomach is kind of a modified tube with a pouch um, that uh, allows the stuff to hang around a little bit longer. But the food is broken down mainly by the stomach uh, with its uh, hydrochloric acid and pepsin, but it begins at the teeth. Actually, it begins at the table, I guess, for us because we use tools to make it and do smaller and smaller and smaller pieces because that's ultimately what we're doing is we're breaking it apart and breaking it apart and breaking it apart. So, um, really, when it comes to uh, to us physically processing it, uh, it is a matter of us chewing it up and ripping it apart from a physical or a uh, mechanical standpoint, and then we already start to break it down in the mouth with the saliva um, as a chemical processing, and saliva salivary amylase actually starts the, uh, the breakdown process on um, the uh, carbohydrates that are found in our food. <clears throat> All right, so this kind of shows us um, a little bit of the uh, workings of the colon here, the large intestine, and where it comes from. Um, the ileocecal valve is where the small intestine dumps into the large intestine. Keep in mind that the small intestine is intending to make the food as close to liquid as possible so it's easy to pick apart and it's easy to digest and pick out the nutrients. The large intestine's intent is to actually re-solidify things and take out the extra water. So a significant amount of your water actually does come from your food. Um, so when this liquid slush comes in from, through the ileocecal valve, starts its journey then through the, the colon or the large intestine, uh, that's when a lot of dehydration occurs. The majority of the nutrients are pulled out through the small intestines. There is some nutrient and some water, um, a lot of water, uh, removed via the large intestine. So numerous layers here kind of have these little... Uh, uh, nodules or nodes here that kind of gives it a little bit of a rough surface in order to kind of uh, package this stuff together uh, into a solid or semi-solid uh, form so it can be removed from the body. So it goes up the ascending, across the transverse, down the descending, into the sigmoid colon where it then drops into the rectum and is stored until at which time uh, the person has the need to move their bowel in which the anus then, of course, opens up and drops out the, uh, the contents. So you have a couple of sphincters, which are circular muscles in there that hold things together, in theory. So the stomach content uh, dissolves. The stomach dissolves a lot of the this, this solid foods and breaks it up. It does a pretty good job of starting to break down some of the proteins and the fats. And, and of course, most of the carbohydrates are broken down moves it into the uh, in the small intestine or 
which is referred to the duodenum. Um, the, in that nature, when it's very liquid like that, it's referred to as chyme. Uh, the nutrients are absorbed as it passes through the intestines. Uh, it gets acted upon by the gallbladder, uh, introducing things uh, such as uh, um, totally lost it. Uh, the gallbladder has its uh, it, its uh, secretions that uh, deal with fats uh, and and somewhat the proteins and the uh, pancreas will then work on the uh, a lot of the carbohydrates and then a little bit more of the of the fats uh, in order to make them in a more usable manner. So um, they share a duct, they share a pathway. Uh, they're not the you know they're they're located actually basically on separate sides of the abdomen, but kind of Y in together, and uh, will then drop their uh, their various uh, juices and, and content into the mix. Um, the intestinal contents then move their way through into the large intestine. Water is reabsorbed, creates this fecal mass. Already talked about the salivary glands. They uh, secrete salivary amylase uh, from into the oral cavity, helps moisten the food, starts the breakdown process. Um, there we go, bile. Uh, liver uh, is uh, uh, processes our nutrients and our medications, detoxifier, detoxes our blood, breaks down and synthesizes different substances, stores our substances such as sugar. Um, the liver has been identified to have hundreds of functions that it performs. Uh, the gallbladder, uh, it secretes bile, which is what I was just looking for, but uh, the gallbladder secretes bile and uh, has to do with, uh, um, it gets it gets a lot of its bile actually from the liver, but uh, uh, has to do with a lot with fat. So people who have gallbladder issues usually uh, have their gallbladder flare after having a fatty meal. And then the pancreas we know has both endocrine and exocrine functions. The exocrine functions, it secretes its pancreatic juices to help in digestion, and the endocrine function is that of, of the uh, insulin, the glucagon, and the somatostatin. So, a complaint of abdominal pain can be due to uh, a renal or urinary problem, vascular disorder, gynecologic disorder in women, pneumonia, AMI, as well as gastrointestinal disorders. If in doubt, and there's the possibility that it's something more severe, consider that. So we've got all this stuff in there, um, and a lot of it has uh, um, some pretty uh, specific functions, but uh, much of it has a very difficult time uh, showing its true colors and saying, giving us a, a signal that says, hey, yes, here truly is, is the, uh, the problematic structure in here that's given us a hard time. Um, so a lot of times it's very vague symptoms. So the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, pain, uh, and that pain can be either very diffuse and widespread, or sometimes the pain is very pinpoint uh, and visceral. So um, they may have some bloating, anorexia, uh, jaundice, rectal pain, metemesis, which is blood in the emesis, melana, uh, which is... Uh, dark, tarry stools, hematochesia, blood in the stools. So some possible sources of abdominal pain by region and also understanding that they don't like to play by the rules. Uh, upper, right upper quadrant, potentially gallbladder or liver. However, may also be pneumonia or pleuritis or pleurisy. Um, left upper, spleen or part of the pancreas. And again, could be pneumonia or pleurisy. The epigastric region, which is kind of between the two uppers, is the, uh, the stomach or the pancreas. However, may also be AMI, could potentially even be appendicitis, and appendicitis is way down low. Uh, the umbilical and the hypogastric region, so right down the midline, around the belly button and below it, small intestine, large intestine, aorta, urinary bladder, and females could be uterine potential bowel obstruction or appendicitis. Um, right lower, 
appendix ascending colon and females would be the right ovary and fallopian tube and left would be descending colon um, potentially could be diverticuli there uh, usually located in the descending colon we'll get to that uh, or could be the left ovary and left fallopian tube in females so again we're going to do a scene size up on this whole uh, system here and see if we can detect anything. In many cases there's not a lot that we can really pick up. Uh, if anything you might go check the bathroom, see if there's any evidence of uh, bloody emesis, bloody stools. Orthostatic vital signs tend to be uh, more commonly taken in the GI patient because of the potential for that hidden internal bleeding. Um, we can examine the skin, examine the abdomen. If you're going to do a physical exam of the abdomen or you're going to try to elicit a pain response, uh, remember to start as far away from their complaint as possible and work your way closer because you start right where it hurts the most, they're going to probably not let you continue. So um, medical history, ask for things like nausea, vomiting, anything they've taken for these sorts of things, any blood in the stools, dark stools, any vomiting, any lightheadedness, um, and then of course if we get things, you know, they're telling us about stool, they're telling us about their vomit, describe it, okay? So we might ask them, well, was there any blood in your stool? Um, or was there, you know, was it dark and tarry? Did it look like coffee grounds? Um, and often we get this, well, I didn't look. Well, then how did you know you were done wiping? So what did it look like on the toilet paper? So, <clears throat> so some specific problems that we may have pop up with uh, couple of the various uh, organ systems. The liver, uh, liver tends to be a steady dull pain in the right upper quadrant. It has a tendency to bleed because it is a solid organ and it is really the only organ that causes jaundice. Um, the gallbladder can, is kind of a kind of accessory to it so it could, um, but you know, it, liver gallbladder complex we, we could say causes jaundice. Um, hepatitis, Hepatitis is a term for an inflammation of the liver. There's various causes of this. It can be anything from uh, things like hepatitis A, which is caused by usually rodent droppings, hepatitis C, which is transmitted usually by uh, blood, as is hepatitis B, and there's several other versions of hepatitis. Sometimes it's an alcoholic hepatitis, very generalized flu-like symptoms, and then large tender liver. Cirrhosis. Cirrhosis tends to cause ascites, which is that fluid buildup in the abdomen. Uh, can lead to uh, a uh, enlarged liver or come from actually an enlarged liver and uh, can also cause uh, the patient to have so much tension and, and distress in their abdomen that it's very difficult for them to breathe. Uh, gallbladders, these tend to be gallstones be the biggest issue with them. Uh, gallbladder or gallstones, uh, the, these stones will start to block the bile duct so it doesn't allow the, the bile to flow. It gives them a crampy, colicky pain, usually somewhere within half an hour to an hour after eating, especially a high fat meal. Alcohol also uh, sometimes uh, elicits this. So it's also right upper quadrant pain, can radiate into the right shoulder, scapula, or the back. And they often will have nausea and vomiting. Cholecystitis uh, may also have a fever, so if they have an infection or an inflammation of their gallbladder, uh, may also lead to jaundice. Uh, the stomach, all kinds of things, potentially gastritis, where you just have an inflammation of the stomach or an infection in there. Could have a, an ulcer, peptic ulcer disease. Um, could have a um, hiatal hernia where part of your stomach actually is pulled up through the diaphragm and some stomach acid traps there kind of causes a little bit of a burning. Um, hematemesis is possible when you get blood in the, in the vomit. Uh, it's usually an indication that something is inflamed in there. Most likely it's probably either a, a, a probably a, a peptic ulcer. They can also have a perforated ulcer, and then if they have a perforated ulcer, they've actually burned through their stomach lining and now are starting to leak some stomach uh, acids into their abdominal cavity, and it's going to cause them to have a peritonitis where it's actually starting to essentially um, digest their own organs. 
acute pancreatitis. <clears throat> it's a sudden onset of a constant severe pain in the epigastric region. Uh, it can feel as though they're getting basically bored through, uh, so somebody's trying to drive a stake through them. Um, usually we'll have nausea and vomiting. They can also have uh, a, a sudden onset uh, change of, of um, mental status. could be a gradual one, I guess, for that matter, too. They may, and that would be, um, this is the potential for a patient to develop uh, new onset diabetes. Uh, the spleen, uh, when it is enlarged or irritated, uh, you'll have a, a pain in the upper left quadrant. It can be referred to the left shoulder and neck. You can rupture a spleen. It's usually as a result of trauma. Um, there's a sudden intense pain that subsides and then intensifies can, and is usually present with uh, orthostatic hypertension and potentially syncope. The biggest people who have problems with their spleen that are non-traumatic are people with sickle cell disease. The sickles, uh, the sickle cells start to agglutinate and clump together and uh, make blood flow uh, uh, very difficult, so they cause a crisis in there. Anemia. Uh, anemia is a complication of chronic occult gastrointestinal bleeding, so significant bleeding into the gastrointestinal tract. Um, if we're suspicious of anemia, um, oxygen is really a big issue. They're probably low on blood or low on some of the content of their blood. So trying to increase uh, the available oxygen to these people uh, has to be part of our, uh, our major um, concern. Uh, patients with abdominal pain often are comfortable laying with, uh, on their side with their legs drawn up in a fetal position. It takes the, the majority of the uh, tension off those abdominal muscles and makes it uh, so there's not so much pressure on them. And then the gastrointestinal disorders may have a life-threatening underlying cause. We could have a severe enough gastrointestinal bleed they can become hypovolemic. So, um, that the other half of that chart that we were looking at on the previous slide, uh, the whole chart's found on 615. Um, touch on a couple other things there. Uh, large and small intestine. You can have a gastroenteritis, which is, uh, or you can have an inflammatory bowel disease, ileitis, colitis. These all present with a crampy, colicky style pain, usually nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. It can be dehydration. You could have food poisoning. Food poisoning uh, occurs generally two to eight hours after the or after you ate. Uh, so you you ate two to two to eight hours uh, before this all came on. People do not get food poisoning and 20 minutes later um, start um, barfing their guts out. Uh, it takes time. Food poisoning is bacterial contamination, and it takes time for that bacteria to build up. Uh, vomiting, diarrhea, dehydration electrolyte disturbances. Uh, the more liquid that you're forcefully ejecting from your body, the greater chances are of having some dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. You can have a bowel obstruction. This starts usually just kind of a generalized achy pain and then becomes very intense, constant. It's very hard to localize it. Um, and they usually will also have some shallow respiration because um, uh, the more they breathe, the more uh, irritation it causes. Diverticulitis. Um, diverticulitis, they'll have these kind of signs of peritonitis or inflammation in their abdomen. Again, it's usually kind of a, uh, a severe but hard to localize pain. Diverticulitis is when you actually get these little outpouchings, uh, these little uh, fissures more or less, in which you have these little sacs that open up into the wall of the, the intestine, um, almost like a little cave off the rock cliff. Um, and then some of the fecal content gets in there, and it doesn't get ejected, doesn't get cleaned out, and then it starts to, uh, to cause a, an infection in there. Um, aortic issues, they complain of intense or tearing pain in the low back or abdomen, radiate down one or both legs. They may have no pedal pulses. Uh, it's possible that they'll have some vascular and neurologic signs in one or both extremities. Maybe a little syncope, hypotension, a sense of impending doom. They tell you, I think I'm going to die. Better believe them. 
and then uh, the possibility of a pulsatile mass in the midline lower abdomen. Uh, not always, and sometimes it's very hard to detect uh, because of their uh, the size of the patient. You can have a uh, very uh, obese patient. It would be di more difficult to find that. Uh, kidneys and ureters. You can have a nephritis, which is a dull, constant flank pain, and possibility of uh, uh, painful urination, hematuria. Kidney stones. We talk about that more in the in the GU chapter, but uh, sharp colicky pain intensifies until it gets past. Usually, you can kind of feel it moving on down. Um, usually, patients will want to stand. Men may complain of pain in the tip of their penis. Um, the appendix usually starts again very, very uh, diffuse, hard to localize pain, and then becomes almost pinpoint. They can almost perfectly put their finger on it, say it's right here, it's in the right lower quadrant, right near the crease uh, of their leg, uh, midway between really their pubic bone and their iliac crest. Um, and it may actually all of a sudden get better. This was severe pain and fever, and uh, the fever will remain, but the pain will instantly get better, and they feel a little, they feel kind of this instant relief. But that's actually because it ruptured, and now it's going to start to spill its content into the gut. And then ovar ovaries and fallopian tubes, um, the ovarian cyst is a constant dull pain um, on one side usually. If it ruptures. They may also get a little bit of, a, of an immediate relief and then followed by peritonitis. They may also have some radiation into either shoulder. Ectopic pregnancy is another crampy, colicky pain. It intensifies. They get signs of peritonitis, become orthostatic, and often shocky if it goes uh, for too long. So by just simply looking at this chart, this table, we see that so many of these things look almost identical. So it's very hard for us to pinpoint a lot of these things. So uh, to think about it, anemia uh, is a frequent complication of GI bleed. Hemoglobin molecules carry oxygen, uh, but the total arterial oxygen content for the anemic patient is lower because there's fewer hemoglobin molecules to carry it. So when is an anemia patient at risk? Well, they are at risk when usually the biggest risk for them is for the hidden injuries. People who have blood spraying out, uh, we, we get that. We see that immediately. But it's the people who have that slow, quiet GI bleed that we don't immediately see. Those people are at higher risk of developing a life-threatening shock. Um, also, um, you know, if we douse these people in too much fluids, too many IV fluids, uh, we run run the risk of uh, you know, temporarily elevating their blood pressure, but then causing them to drop off because they just continue to bleed. And as they bleed and bleed and bleed, the red cells go away, which continue to fill them up with salt water. So general causes and assessment of abdominal pain. So general causes, we have this infl inflammation or infection. We have a stretching of a tissue, or we have ischemia. Those are the general times in which we have something haywire here. We may have a couple of different types of pain here. Um, visceral pain, we've talked about this before, but visceral pain, uh, this is from the organs uh, in the abdominal cavity. It's very difficult for that patient to locate it. They can't just put a perfect finger on it. Whereas parietal pain or somatic pain, um, that uh, this is an inflammation of the peritoneum that lines the abdominal cavity. So we thought visceral pain was uh, difficult to, to locate. Parietal pain can actually just cover that whole section. So we may be able to pinpoint some pain with, say, okay, there's sharp pain right here. But in many cases, um, there's such large organs and such a, a network of uh, vessels and artery, or vessels and nerves that it's, uh, it's very difficult uh, to uh, fully assess. Preferred pain, don't forget occasionally this, we have pain and it actually is felt in a remote site because of the shared nerve pathway. Biggest, biggest ones that we talk about, pain in the left shoulder from spleen issues, pain in the right shoulder from 
uh, gallbladder issues, but there are others. Okay, that goes on with your uh, case study. So nausea and vomiting, define the following terms. Oh, good Lord. Um, the, defining nausea. Nausea is the um, feeling that a patient is going to throw up. Whereas vomiting uh, is obviously them throwing up. The vomiting triggers. Um, so we have sensory nerve stimulation in the pharynx. We have gastrointestinal tract, the heart, and other organs uh, that can trigger it and uh, make us need to vomit. Uh, usually uh, the biggest things that cause it is things such as um, a, a hormonal uh, shift. So epi nor epi dump uh, tend to make us a little bit more uh, nauseated. So um, retching, uh, so with retching we have um, is actually dry heaves. Um, emesis is when we actually do vomit. Emesis is the product. Um, but also remember with vomiting comes risks. We can tear things, we can uh, aspirate, so there's a lot of potential problems that can uh, arise simply from vomiting. Nobody likes to do it, it's pretty uncomfortable. So projectile vomiting in neonates uh, can be an indication of a pyloric stenosis. So basically they can't move anything out of their stomach on into the intestinal tract um, and that stomach becomes over distended. Uh, and then they do this projectile vomiting. So, you know, it shoots a couple feet away. Uh, that's your projectile vomiting, not just directly into, you know, kind of rolls out. It fires across the room. So disorders of the esophagus. Uh, we have the hiatal hernia uh, that I've been mentioning before. Uh, so you can see here they've represented as part of the uh, gastrointestinal tract uh, part of the stomach, I'm sorry, has been pulled up through the diaphragm um, and then a little bit of that acid kind of sits in that pouch and it causes some, some discomfort. Um, it, a lot of times is um, mistaken for uh, a cardiac related chest pain. We tend to treat it more as a uh, potential cardiac problem for the simple fact that the cardiac issue is uh, the, the more dangerous of the two. So uh, we're erring on the side of caution with that. A lot of times patients will complain of uh, you know, kind of heartburn, um, burping up kind of an acidic uh, uh, flavor or taste. Um, so hiatal hernia is pretty common. Uh, remember, hernia is any time so, which something gets pulled through a lining or through a uh, usually a muscle. So. Esophageal varices. Um, esophageal varices are varicose veins of the esophagus. And I guess if you want to think about uh, varicose veins, we could also talk about varicose veins of the anus or the rectum actually are um, hemorrhoids. So they're inflamed, dilated vessels. Uh, they tend to result in, in bleeding. Esophageal varices. Uh, tends to come from people who are frequent vomiters, so eating disorder patients, people that are alcoholics, um, tend to develop esophageal varices. Um, they eventually can get to the point in which they rupture and cause severe bleeding, and it can be uh, fatal bleeding. Esophagitis is simply an inflammation of the esophagus. It can be uh, an infection. It can be reflux of acid content. So it's often referred to as GERD, G-E-R-D, gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, causes an esophagitis, uh, but basically they're getting um, stomach acids to uh, splash up into their esophagus and, and actually burning it. And there's GERD right there. The hiatal hernia, we already talked about. Dysphagia, phagia, not phase with an S, phage with a G, uh, is a difficulty in swallowing. Most commonly seen in people who have had some sort of a, of a neurologic deficit, uh, stroke patients, uh, patients with post-head injury, uh, those people will lose some of their, uh, their nervous 
system control as well as the, the muscle uh, tone for uh, the swallowing process. This condition is often a result of a, a motility disorder or a mechanical obstruction. So something stuck in there um, or something is keeping it from actually moving as well. So you may have somebody who has a tumor that's grown into there and that's, that's causing it to, uh, to not pass. So the patient cannot move liquid solids or both uh, down the esophagus into the stomach. Uh, they can, it's just difficult. Aphagia would be they can't do it at all. Upper GI bleeds uh, can be caused from things such as gastritis or general inflammation of the stomach. Uh, peptic ulcers or stomach ulcers, inflammation uh, or ulceration in the duodenum. Um, these people who have upper GI bleeds typically will have a fresh looking, or a, a red fresh uh, bloody appearance uh, in their emesis. Um, depends on how long things sit around, it may actually look more like a coffee ground emesis. Uh, so a coffee ground emesis I mean, that, that's a perfect description of it, where actually a lot of the, uh, the blood has been digested by the stomach acids, um, making it um, kind of agglutinate together there and then dissolving it and breaking it down. And that gives it that black coffee, coffee ground appearance. Then we also have melana. The melana uh, is the dark tarry stools. That's not quite... Um, well, actually, it is. It's, it's fairly common in, in the uh, the upper intestinal uh, upper GI bleed that doesn't vomit the, most of it out. So if it occurs a little later in the process, they don't get the nausea. They may get that dark tarry stool. Um, the closer it gets towards the rectum, the greater chance it's going to be more red in color. GI bleeds, upper or lower, can lead to hypovolemic shock for shock appropriately. So let's see, appendicitis, um, normal appendix versus an inflamed appendix. Remember a lot of times we get this uh, little pocket of infection that builds up in there and the appendicitis, um, uh, that technically means inflammation of the appendix and it's when um, usually makes people fairly sick. Now in this day and age of modern medicine, it seems like appendicitis is have, uh, have reduced quite a bit in number, uh, but they still occur and uh, people still uh, end up going in for appendectomies. Gastro, uh, gastroenteritis, that's the inflammation of the stomach and the intestines due to a specific pathogen, whether that be viral, bacterial, uh, parasitic, could technically be fungal. Um, in most cases, it's, it's some sort of a viral or bacterial bug that people have gotten. Uh, e. coli infection would cause a gastroenteritis. You normally have E. coli in your gastrointestinal tract, but it's when your body can't handle it that it actually becomes a big issue. Um, appendicitis, we've kind of talked about that. Um, usually gets uh, either an obstruction in there or just inflamed. Common uh, people to see this are between 10 and 30 years old can occur at any age, usually very vague symptoms of uh, you know, low-grade fever, kind of uh, um, constipation and uh, fluish-like symptoms. But, uh, the pain's going to increase with any movement and, and any jarring. Um, diverticulitis. You can have diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Diverticulosis is the uh, condition of having diverticula. You can see an example in 621 on your, in your text of what diverticula actually are like. These little uh, outpouchings or little uh, extra rooms or cells uh, outside the, uh, um, inside the wall of the uh, colon. And they get uh, clogged with uh, fecal material and start to have some inflammation. Um, signs or symptoms are very similar to that of any of our other intestinal disorders. Um, abdominal pain, in most cases they complain of left lower abdominal pain is where most of the diverticuli are, are found. Um, most people with diverticulitis are over the age of 50. They may complain of some diarrhea um, or GI bleed in some cases. 
diverticulitis is the actual flaring. Here's a volvulus of the small intestine, which could also be considered a bowel obstruction. Uh, bowel obstruction is when we have uh, patients who uh, can't move fecal material through the system. Maybe it's from there being some other large blockage in there like a tumor. Maybe it's from a volvulus. Volvulus means it twisted, so it's kind of twisted upon itself. Um, there's another thing that sometimes occurs. It's called an intussusception. And when it's actually the bowel kind of envelops over the top of another part of the bowel. So it, it kind of sucks part of the bowel inside of, of one section of the bowel. Um, that occurs from time to time more commonly in a pediatric population. But lower GI bleed. Uh, lower GI bleed uh, it, it's, can be anywhere from minor to completely life-threatening. Um, can be a huge number of causes, maybe things such as diverticuli, could be tumors, uh, could simply be that there's weakened areas that have, have kind of burst occasionally, even people with um, some aneurysms will have some lower GI bleed. So <clears throat> usually the closer to the rectum it is, the more chance it is it's going to be brighter red blood uh, in the stool as opposed to black tariness of the stool. Uh, we talked about the bowel obstruction. Uh, sometimes it's even bands of adhesion, so scar tissue basically. Um, so they've had some sort of surgery or something's happened, um, and it doesn't allow the, the, the colon to expand and contract like it's supposed to. Remember, the whole process of digestion occurs through um, uh, the process of uh, peristalsis, whereas peristalsis is kind of a constant squeezing down, pushing the food to the next section, then it squeezes down and pushes food to the next section, then it squeezes down and pushes it to the next section, and so on and so forth. It doesn't allow it to contract and expand like it needs to. Hernia. We can have hernias. Uh, hernias are when we have bowel that actually becomes strangled uh, in something. So an example of, uh, of most hernias that we talk about are people who have a uh, umbilical hernia, where the part of their umbilical core, I'm sorry, their, uh, their umbilicus or belly button kind of pops out because a loop of bowel gets in there. The other common uh, abdominal uh, hernia is a inguinal hernia in which a loop of bowel then slips down into the uh, scrotum and, uh, and it can become, uh, they'll call it incarcerated or uh, strangulated in there and it starts to become ischemic. We have some inflammatory bowel diseases. There's a few of these, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's being the biggest ones. Um, ulcerative colitis is limited strictly to the colon, where Crohn's can be anywhere within the gastrointestinal tract, including the, the small intestines. Uh, basically, uh, in, in these cases, it's an autoimmune disorder where the body starts to kind of attack itself. Um, they may complain of severe abdominal pains and cramps. Um, bloody diarrhea, uh, fever, anorexia, uh, and these people uh, generally, uh, it's, it's kind of a miserable uh, disease to have because people uh, will, will have days in which they're kind of knocked out of, out of life because uh, they're dealing with uh, all the, the cramping and the pain and, and symptoms that go along with it. Constipation. Uh, constipation is when you uh, have infrequent bowel movements, usually because of uh, excessive uh, water reabsorption from the colon. Uh, very, very hard feces. Most people probably have had to deal with this, either with themselves or their children. Treatments usually include softeners and laxatives. And the easiest thing to do is to not get constipated to begin with. People who drink tons and tons and tons of caffeinated beverages dehydrate the heck out of their stool, therefore giving themselves constipation. So maybe cut back from two pots of coffee a day to one or a half a pot of coffee a day uh, and you know, cut the sodas way back and chances are that your constipation will probably improve. Hemorrhoids, talked about hemorrhoids before. Hemorrhoids are uh, swollen uh, and it's 
inflamed large blood vessels in the anal canal in the rectum. Um, a lot of times uh, a complaint of perianal itching and burning and uh, they can uh, have some uh, presence of blood uh, usually uh, upon uh, either having bowel movement or, or wiping. So, swallowed foreign bodies uh, depends a lot on the object uh, and where, where it's found in the digestive tract. Kids do this quite a bit. Um, most objects will move through pretty easily. You have to worry about things that are either sharp and can get tangled up in something. Um, things that have a volatile nature. One of the biggest things that I've heard of recently becoming an issue with being swallowed is kids um, swallowing button cell batteries, watch battery, calculator batteries, so on and so forth, the round batteries, uh, little round discs. And uh, uh, those are, can be actually very, very dangerous uh, when swallowed because the stomach acids will then combine uh, start to break them apart, and then they can start to spill the content of those batteries. I mean, any battery is going to be bad. You don't still hear about people nearly as much eating other batteries, but uh, and uh, they can they can actually start to to burn you from the inside out, and kind of ugly. So things can get trapped in there. Of course, if you have something like a diverticulitis or you have bowel obstruction, of course that actually even makes uh, more of an issue. So we also have the other oddball thing that occurs from time to time with uh, swallowing uh, people who are being mules, uh, who are trying to uh, smuggle things into the country, uh, drugs and whatnot, by swallowing them, packing them in their intestinal tract, and then they'll get across the border or whatever, and, uh, and then eventually they pass these things. Well, occasionally they don't come through the same way that they so they will, uh, oddly enough, a lot of times drugs are packaged in condoms that get tied shut. Uh, they swallow the condoms, and then uh, once in a while one of those condoms breaks and spills that drug content. And, you know, it can be heroin, meth, cocaine, whatever. Uh, and then the patient has signs and symptoms of an overdose. All right, so we know kids put stuff in their mouth. The younger they are, the greater chance that this is happening. Occasionally, they're going to swallow some dangerous objects. Um, and then what kind of common household items uh, present a big risk for kids when swallowed? I've already mentioned batteries. Larger coins uh, can be kind of an issue, so quarters, depending on the size of the child. Um, of course, anything that is potentially toxic. Um, and then things, we, we also have to worry about airway obstruction when we deal with some of those as well. Pancreatitis, this is inflammation of the pancreas, um, usually causes a mid-abdominal pain, very, very sick patient, lots of nausea and vomiting, usually kind of starting to, to work on some sepsis as well as dehydration. The most common uh, patient with um, pancreatitis is chronic alcoholics. Uh, however, it can also, like I mentioned earlier, be the uh, uh, straw that, that, that breaks the camel's back and causes a, uh, you know, a person to become a, a new diabetic. So uh, the mortality of acute pancreatitis is fairly high because they get so septic. Um, and then you can have erosion of the pancreas. Uh, that can include the blood vessels, and that causes internal hemorrhage. So uh, pretty nasty. You know, a couple people with pancreatitis, they were very, very sick for a very long time. All right, liver diseases, hepatitis. We can have infectious and non-infectious hepatitis. Many of them are viral. A few of them are bacterial. Um, some of the non-infectious diseases include certain medications. So somebody, say, who's overdosed on um, Tylenol, they're going to roach their liver. So they could get a hepatitis from a Tylenol overdose. Uh, alcoholics get uh, typically non-infectious uh, hepatitis. Um, chronic hepatitis can lead to liver cancer, can lead to cirrhosis, where basically your liver kind of 
more or less turns into a concrete block. You can get portal vein hypertension where you actually have a hypertension between your liver and your intestines. Cirrhosis, this is a progressive disease caused by inflammation and where the liver tissues uh, go from being their normal sponge like nature to a scar tissue that doesn't function nearly as well um, if at all. So common causes of cirrhosis include chronic alcohol abuse, fatty liver, so people who have very very high fat diets um, and who have some predispositions to cholesterol and whatnot uh, can develop fatty livers. <clears throat> the body has a hard time breaking down some of those fats and uh, starts to uh, can't metabolize it and it starts to kind of take its its place within the liver and people with chronic hepatitis. Okay, some patients with liver failure are candidates for liver transplantation. The good thing about liver transplants is people can live with a portion of a liver or you can transplant a portion of somebody's liver into someone else and both the recipient and the donor will regenerate uh, the missing liver tissue. So uh, patients who receive the donor liver generally end up on these rejection drugs um, and the drugs are going to suppress some of that uh, immune function making them highly susceptible to more different infections. So, but that's kind of the beauty of the liver is it, it's, uh, it's a pretty, pretty vibrant uh, organ. So, cholecystitis. So this is an inflammation of the gallbladder. May or may not be from gallstones. In most cases, it actually is. Um, so the gallstones uh, occur uh, in comparison to kidney stones. Kidney stones are usually... Uh, salts and elemental in nature and uh, choli or, uh, gallstones are usually fatty in nature. So um, They're smooth. If you look up gallstones, uh, do a Google search for gallstones, do a Google search for kidney stones, you'll see they're, they're vastly different. Uh, gallstones are actually in some way kind of uh, could be oddly considered pretty, but uh, the uh, signs or symptoms are nausea, vomiting, severe cases um, that gallbladder can become ischemic and cause a major peritonitis. Remember that uh, in most cases it's going to cause some pain up in that right shoulder is a referred pain. Most common people with cholecystitis are overweight Caucasian women with a history of at least one pregnancy. Um, the Pima Indian and the Hispanic uh, nature, or I'm sorry, Pima Indians and the Hispanic uh, uh, descent uh, also are common uh, demographics to uh, get cholecystitis. Um, and then cholecystitis can occur in young and old, both genders, all ethnicities. A lot of it has to do with lifestyle. Okay, so we can talk about some other causes of abdominal pain. Uh, we could have some things such as pneumonia. Pneumonia can get referred into the upper quadrants of the abdomen uh, simply for the fact that the lungs come down all the way to the, the uh, diaphragm and the diaphragm is just a, a thin layer of muscle that separates the abdominal cavity from the chest cavity. Myocardial infarction pain or discomfort can extend to the epigastric region. It makes it very, very difficult for us to uh, say, oh yes, this is definitely an abdominal problem or this is definitely a heart problem because, again, it's right next door. Uh, the spleen uh, being very highly vascular, it can rupture. We talked a little bit about splenic issues earlier. Kidney problems, kidney stones, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, um, and the, the AAA uh, we've already, already discussed. So, there's a video on it. So again, knowing that the AMP, the pathophys, uh, that gastrointestinal system, uh, helps us relate better to what's actually going on. The patient can have some uh, abdominal pain arising from various causes, maybe numerous causes at the same time. 
Life-threatening nature can require uh, some immediate transport for patients with certain abdominal pains for evaluation by a physician. And then during transport, make the patient as comfortable as possible. Administer O2 if they have signs of shock or um, shallow respirations or they're hypoxic. Um, consider fluid replacement. Usually uh, they're going to get an IV anyway, so might as well go ahead and start one. That's necessary. Give them some fluid boluses. And you can consult with medical direction regarding analgesia. Um, with paramedics, we're very, very cautious on giving any of the IV analgesic drugs because they can have longer uh, duration, longer effects, which can be uh, difficult for the physicians to actually do a nice thorough exam uh, on these patients. However, with the use of nitrous oxide, patients with nitrous oxide uh, generally are only uh, under its influence for a couple of minutes. It wears off pretty quickly and uh, they can kind of bounce back. Positioning is another big thing that goes along with this. It goes up there with making the patient comfortable. So making it so they can either have their knees uh, bent and elevated or having them rolled on the side in the fetal position. And then of course treatment for shock, standard basic uh, treatments there. And that wraps up this chapter.